Appropriate for our conference coming up. This morning, as we continue our study of the book of Acts, we find ourselves in the opening verses of chapter 1, which is really unique. It is very different from the rest of the book. As you'll recall, when I introduced Acts to you several weeks ago, I made it a point to explain that Luke, the author, wrote this book to a man by the name of Theophilus, who appears to have been some kind of a ranking a Roman official. And his purpose, he tells us in writing to Theophilus, was to pick up where he left off in his first account of the life of Christ, which we know to be the Gospel of Luke. Notice how Luke words the first two verses of Acts. It says, the first account, notice, the first account I composed Theophilus <clears throat> about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven after he had, by the Holy Spirit, given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. Now, the fact that Luke speaks of Christ's earthly ministry as all that Jesus began to do and teach indicates that this second volume that he has also written to Theophilus, the book of Acts, is intended to inform him of what Jesus continued to do after he rose from the dead and then returned to the Father. In other words, what this tells us is the purpose of Acts is to let us know that the works and the teaching of Jesus Christ did not cease with his death, but he continued, and he continues even now, to work and teach, but what Luke is telling us, he continued then to work and teach, only now his, his work and his teachings would be carried on through carefully selected men who represented him, specifically the apostles. Therefore, based on these two verses, we understand that the book of Acts is exactly what its name indicates. It is Jesus carrying out his acts, his activities, his actions through his apostles as they take the message of the gospel throughout the Roman Empire so that it travels all the way from Jerusalem to the imperial city of that day, the city of Rome. So, Acts is about the acts of Jesus Christ through the apostles, and in particular, the apostles Peter and Paul, because they were so instrumental in bringing the gospel to the Gentiles. But here in the opening section of chapter 1, we don't see the apostles doing anything, anything except meeting with Jesus and getting instruction from him. It isn't until chapter 2 that the real evangelistic action begins as Peter preaches this incredible sermon on the day of Pentecost. He confronts thousands of Jewish people in the city of Jerusalem with the message of the gospel about their Messiah. Now, the fact that chapter 1 is so different from the rest of the book of Acts tells us that something had to take place in the lives of these men before they would be ready to do Christ's evangelistic work. That's exactly what we discover in this opening section of Acts. From verses 3 through 9 in chapter 1, we read about Jesus meeting with these men over a period of 40 days. This was following his resurrection, and he did this until he ascended and returned back to the Father. And his purpose in meeting with them was to prepare them to minister for him. In other words, he was getting them ready, folks. He was equipping them so that they would be effective in their witness for him. So far, from what we have seen then in our studies, this preparation involved two essential truths that they needed to know before they would be ready to evangelize. First of all, they needed to be convinced that Jesus was alive. And so we read in verse 3, to these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs. Every time Jesus met with the apostles during this 40-day period, it was for the purpose of convincing them that he was really alive, driving the truth home. Every time he met with them, it was driven home to them that he was not a ghost. They were not hallucinating. He wasn't an illusion. It was really him the one they had spent three years with, but now he was in a resurrected, glorified body of flesh and bones. But in addition to being convinced of his resurrection, there was a second essential truth that they needed to know 
if they were going to be effective witnesses for him, they needed to know the content of their message. They needed to know what they were supposed to say. And so we read, continuing in verse 3, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking, notice, of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Every time Jesus met with his disciples, he spoke to them about the kingdom of God. In other words, he gave them instruction concerning God's kingdom, which, as we discovered last Sunday, involved teaching them about, first of all, his present-day spiritual kingdom in which he reigns as king over the hearts of his people, but also, secondly, he would be teaching them about his future earthly millennial kingdom, and his purpose in doing this was to help the apostles to understand the content of their message. Remember, the, the, only, the only preaching, the only message that the apostles had really heard Jesus give was, follow me, follow me. And he presented himself as king to the Jewish people. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Follow me as your king which meant surrender your, your hearts to me. So prior to the cross, Jesus really didn't explain about his death. He mentioned that it was coming, but didn't explain the theology of it, that it would be a sacrificial substitutionary death that would be the basis for the forgiveness of anyone's sins who would believe in him. But with his atoning death now being completed, the apostles needed to understand that kingdom preaching now was the same as gospel preaching. It was preaching the grace of God. Their message, though, was to be centered now around Christ's substitutionary death, as they called the lost to repent of their sin, place their trust in Jesus alone for salvation, with the heart attitude of submitting their lives to him as their king. That was their message. And they were not ready to be his witnesses until they understood that message. I mean, how could Jesus send them out to proclaim the gospel when they don't know the gospel? So that's what this is about. He opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Now, this is where we left off last week. In preparing his men to be effective witnesses, the Lord has given them exactly what they needed. They needed to be convinced that he was alive, and they needed to understand the content of their message. Now, it's very likely that after meeting with these apostles all of these days that, you know, I would suspect that they were fired up they were enthusiastic. They were ready to go into all the world and preach the gospel. After all, they were now absolutely convinced of Christ's resurrection. There's no doubt in their minds that he was alive. And they now understood the message of the cross and the gospel that Jesus was sending them out to proclaim. But in spite of all they understood, the Lord knew that they were not ready to be sent out. And they weren't ready to be sent out because their knowledge wasn't enough. Something was still missing in their preparation to be his witnesses. If they were sent out now, the Lord knew that they would have failed miserably. And that's why in verses 4 and 5, Jesus tells them the third essential truth they needed to know to be effective witnesses. And it's a truth that we desperately need to know as well if we are going to be his witnesses right here or anywhere where God leads us. So in addition to needing to know that he was alive and the content of their message, Jesus makes it clear to them that to be his witnesses, they needed to know the source of their spiritual power. Notice what we read in verse 4. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you have heard from me. Now in this statement, Luke tells us about one of those occasions when Jesus met with the apostles during this 40-day time period prior to his ascension. And while this is translated in most of our English Bibles as gathering them together, apparently it was a time when they were eating a meal together. And the reason I say that is because the primary meaning of this particular Greek word is eating with someone. And you know what? That makes perfect sense. Because later, in Acts chapter 10, when Peter is explaining the gospel to a Roman centurion by the name of Cornelius and his family, he states that these appearances that Jesus made to his apostles after his resurrection often included having a meal with them, something to drink, something to eat. Notice, Acts chapter 10, 
verses 39 and 41. This is Peter explaining to Cornelius. He says, we're witnesses of all the things that he, meaning Christ, did both in the lands of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They also put him to death by hanging him on a cross. God raised him up on the third day and granted that he become visible, not to all the people, but to witnesses who were chosen beforehand by God. Now he explains, that is to us. He's talking about meeting with the apostles. To us, notice, who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And Luke tells us that it was during one of these mealtime meetings that Jesus gave the apostles some very specific commands. First of all, he commanded them not to leave the city of Jerusalem. Now, our Lord had died just outside of the city limits of Jerusalem. But we know from the gospel accounts that prior to his death, Jesus had instructed the apostles to meet him in Galilee after his resurrection. That's exactly what they did. And they've done that. But now they're back. They're back in the city of Jerusalem. And the Lord commands them to stay there until something special takes place. And that something special, he tells them, that will take place is that they are going to experience what the Father had promised them. He commands them, wait for what the Father has promised, which he says that you heard from me, meaning he told them about this promise from the Father. Now, the promise that the Father had made to them, which Jesus had told them about, was the promise that the Holy Spirit was going to be given to them in a very unique and special sense that no one else up to that point had experienced. Now, certainly the Lord had told them numerous times during his ministry about the Father giving them the Holy Spirit. For example, in Luke 11, verse 13, he said, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. So the Lord certainly during his ministry had spoken of the Holy Spirit being given to them. However, it wasn't until the upper room farewell discourse, the night in which Jesus was arrested, where the Lord elaborated on this promise the Father was making concerning the Holy Spirit given to them. This is important. If it's not on the screen, I, I believe it is, you should, you should look this up. John chapter 14, starting at verse 16. Jesus said, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see him or know. But you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. Now, this is the promise of the Father that Jesus was referring to during one of those post-resurrection meetings with the apostles. It's a promise that the Father will send to them the Holy Spirit. Who is the Holy Spirit? He is the third person of the Trinity. He is fully God in invisible form. Now, there are several important points that I'd like you to notice that Jesus makes in stating that the Holy Spirit would be given to them. First of all, Jesus referred to the Spirit as another helper. With the word helper, meaning someone who comes alongside to help someone. That's what it means. He's a helper. He helps you. But notice that Jesus didn't simply refer to the Spirit as a helper, but rather he said another helper. Helper. That's very significant because the word that Jesus used for another means another of exactly the same kind. Another who is identical. In other words, Jesus was saying that the Holy Spirit is exactly like he is. In every way, exactly like, like he is. Meaning that the Spirit, in the absence of Christ being here physically, the Spirit will carry on exactly the same ministry of helping helping these disciples that he had done, that he had helped them with during his earthly ministry, except, except instead of being in a physical form as he was, the Spirit will dwell in them in his spirit form. Secondly, I want you to notice exactly how Jesus worded the presence of the Holy Spirit. Notice he said, he will be with you forever. And he abides with you and will be 
in you. Now, this is significant. He will dwell in you forever, Jesus is saying, on a permanent basis, never to leave you. Now, why do I say this is significant? Because this was unique. This had never happened before. During Old Testament times, the Holy Spirit did not indwell people on a permanent basis. He ministered to God's people by coming upon them at certain times in order to empower them for specific acts of service, but he also could leave them at any time. Any time when that act of service had ended or, or he had been grieved by their sin, that's why David prayed in Psalm 51 in connection with his sin with Bathsheba. He said, do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit away from me. That's, that's reflective of the Old Testament teaching on the Spirit of God coming upon believers, but also he could leave. Now, the Lord's apostles had experienced this type of temporary power as the Spirit of God came upon them for specific acts of service. For example, in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus has, has, is about to send them out to preach. This is an evangelistic mission that he's about to send them on, and they are to do healings and miracles. And so we read in Matthew chapter 10, starting in verse 7, as you go preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. And then in verse 20, he says, For it is not you who speak, but it is the spirit of your father who speaks in you. So these men, during that ministry, they were very well acquainted with the empowering of the Holy Spirit. They couldn't be healing people on their own, and they couldn't be speaking forth the words of God without this empowerment. So these men then were well acquainted with the ministry of the Holy Spirit in their lives, enabling them to do this. But this power wasn't always available to them, because just like in Old Testament times, the Spirit would come upon them only for certain acts of service like this, and then, and then he might leave. However, what Jesus was promising them was that the Holy Spirit would dwell in them and never leave them. That's the promise. This was something completely new. It had never happened before to God's people. And that's the reason, folks, that the apostles were not ready to be thrust out into the world as Christ's witnesses. You see, while these men may have had some knowledge, certainly, of Jesus and the message that they were to preach, what they lacked was spiritual power. Without the power that comes from the indwelling Holy Spirit, these men would have tried to carry on their ministry in their own strength, their own resources, and they would have failed miserably. See, what the apostles didn't know is how weak they really were. They didn't understand how utterly dependent they needed to be upon God. They had no clue as to the depth of hostility that they would encounter in the world as Christ's witnesses. Therefore, they needed to understand how needy they were for the Holy Spirit to sustain them, to strengthen them, to empower them in the face of such hostility. Now, understand this. Jesus had given them words of instruction on how weak they were. He told them that. He told them how powerless they were to accomplish anything without his help. I'm not sure they got it. He said, for example, in John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, our Lord didn't mean that you couldn't accomplish anything, but what he did mean was that they couldn't accomplish anything of any lasting spiritual value without him. People can certainly do a lot of things without the Lord. He was talking about bearing fruit, about things of a spiritual nature. Again, here's something fascinating. In Luke chapter 5, at the beginning of our Lord's ministry with these men, the apostles, he gave them an important lesson. It's a good lesson for us on how much that they needed his help, even in some very ordinary tasks, which they thought they were pretty good at, like being capable fishermen. Notice what Jesus told Simon Peter to do. Luke chapter 5, starting at verse 4. I find this fascinating. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered and said, Master, we've worked hard all night 
and caught nothing. But I will do as you say and let down the nets. Now, you know he doesn't believe that this is going to do any good. He's an experienced fisherman, but because the master said this, he'll do it. When they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish and their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boats for them to come and help them. And they came and filled both of the boats so that they began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw, saw that he fell down at Jesus' feet saying, go away from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. For amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to, to Simon, do not fear, from now on you will be catching men. When they had brought their boats to the land, they left everything and followed him. The Lord was teaching them how much they needed to depend on him, not only for success in the ordinary mundane things of, of life, and in their case it wasn't actually mundane, it was their business, fishing, but success in something that they weren't used to, and that was fishing for men. There's a lesson here, meaning witnessing and evangelizing. You're going to need me. You can't do this on your own. They needed his help. They needed the Spirit's empowerment if they were going to win men to him. And, and folks, that's exactly, exactly the same lesson you and I need to learn if we are going to be effective witnesses for Christ. We need to understand that the source of our spiritual power is not ourselves or our human resources. People are not one to Christ based on how well we present the gospel. Now, we ought to know how to present the gospel. People are not one to Christ based on how eloquent we are or based on how much knowledge we have about the Bible or based on how good a job we do in answering their questions and objections about the faith. That's not the way it is. It is the Holy Spirit who prepares hearts to receive the gospel. It is the Holy Spirit who wins people to Christ by regenerating them and opening their hearts to the truth about Christ. It is the Holy Spirit who gives us boldness and courage to witness even in the face of hostility and opposition and sometimes just plain apathy. I wonder if some of the times that we have failed in being a bold witness for the Lord is because we, we really weren't relying on the Holy Spirit and the Lord let us fail in order to teach us this. We didn't pray. We didn't consider the Spirit's role in our evangelistic encounter. And the Lord just let us fail to teach us that it's not by our might or by our strength or by anything we do, but by the Spirit's power that effective witnessing takes place. Listen to these wise and insightful words by John MacArthur from his book about the Holy Spirit entitled The Silent Shepherd. He writes this, two errors regarding the doctrine of the Holy Spirit have clouded the contemporary church's understanding of the person, of his person and ministry. On the one hand, the charismatic movement is obsessed with the Holy Spirit, tending to focus all doctrine and worship on him exclusively. The danger with an undue stress on the gifts and leading of the Holy Spirit is that personal experience is often elevated over the objective truth of Scripture. On the other hand, he says, many non-charismatics tend to ignore the Holy Spirit altogether. Perhaps weary of the controversy, confusion, and subjectivity of the charismatic movement, too many have responded by going to the opposite extreme. They simply avoid the Holy Spirit in their teaching and study. On top of that, he writes, the, that, on top of that, popular evangelicalism as a whole has shifted in recent generations from God-centered ministry to a man-centered approach. Pragmatism rules. The churches are run as business. The gospel is often viewed as a product for marketing. Spiritual problems are dealt with by psychological means. In short, Man-centered ministry virtually operates as if the Holy Spirit were unnecessary. Those are profound words. Profound. That's exactly why the Lord told his apostles then to wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Holy Spirit because they needed to understand that their ministry was not to be man-centered, 
but it was to be empowered by the Spirit of God who as yet had not been given to them, not in that sense of dwelling in them because Jesus had not left yet. It's exactly what we need to learn too. We can't do this by ourselves. We can't do this by ourselves. We need the Spirit's help and enablement and empower, empowering to witness for Christ in any and every situation. Now going back to Acts chapter 1, verse 4, the primary reason, I want you to know, the primary reason that Jesus was telling the apostles that they were to wait in the city of Jerusalem for the coming of the Holy Spirit is because when he came, and by that I mean in the sense of his permanent indwelling presence, he would empower them for the task of being his witnesses. Notice just a few verses later in verse 8, the Lord explicitly spells this out. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. We read the same thing in Luke chapter 24, verse 49. It's all about power. And behold, I'm sending forth, Jesus said, the promise of my Father upon you. But you are to stay in the city until you are clothed, he said, with power from on high. See, above everything else, these men needed the power, the dynamite of the Holy Spirit in order to continue the ministry of Jesus as they witnessed for him. And what did they specifically need power for? Well, one reason they needed the Spirit's enabling power, we often don't think about this now, was for them to receive God's revelation and then to record it. Recorded by the process of divine inspiration, meaning the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said in John 14, 26, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. How did these men who had been with Christ for three years remember some of the most detailed of conversations with him? The Holy Spirit was empowering them. That's the process of inspiration, a mysterious process that none of us completely understands because we have not experienced it, but they did. Also in John 16, verses 12 through 14, Jesus said, I have many more things to say to you, these are to the apostles, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you, notice this, into all truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he'll speak and he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of mine and will disclose it to you. These men needed the Holy Spirit so that they would be able to remember exactly what Jesus had told them and to know truths that, frankly, he hadn't told them, including things to come, future events. These are things that he didn't always tell them about. So we can thank God that the Holy Spirit guided these men into the truth because the end result of all of this is what we have now as the New Testament writings. That is something to be grateful for. But these men also needed the power of the Holy Spirit just to, to keep them witnessing for Christ and sustaining them in the face of such hostility because their words alone would not be very effective. Let me show you what I mean. In John chapter 15, our Lord is explaining to them, you're going to be hated by, by people because of me. He said, if the world hates you, the thought here is since the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. He said, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. If they kept my word, they'll keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake because they don't know the one who sent me. Now Jesus is warning them that witnessing for him once he's gone will be very, very difficult. He's been the target of abuse, but he won't physically be there anymore. So they're going to come after the apostles. They'll be now the target of the world's hatred. But then just after this, notice what the Lord says about the Holy Spirit in connection with, with them being witnesses in this very hostile world. Notice verses 26 and 27. When the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, notice this, he will testify 
about me. And you will testify also because you've been with me from the beginning. So in, in addition, Jesus is saying to you, the apostles testifying about me, he's telling them, you're not alone. You're not out there alone because in addition to your witness, the Holy Spirit is going to work in people's hearts and he will be witnessing, he will be testifying about me. In other words, they can count on the fact that as they tell others about Jesus, the Holy Spirit will be working in the hearts of those they're speaking to and he will be speaking to their hearts as well. He's saying, men, you're not in this alone. It's not just you. You can count on the fact that the Spirit will be active in your witness. He will be the one who convicts people of their sin. He will be the one who will bring about regeneration and salvation. He will be the one who will give them boldness in declaring the gospel even in the face of danger. Now in telling the apostles then to wait in Jerusalem until the coming of the Spirit, these men at this point didn't know how long they needed to wait. The command was just wait. Jesus told them to just stay put until the Father fulfilled his promise to them to send the Holy Spirit. However, in the very next verse, verse 5, in Acts 1, Jesus reveals to them when this will take place, and he clarifies that the promise he's talking about is indeed the promise of the Spirit being given to them. Notice verse 5. For John baptized, this is John the Baptist, really we should call him John the Baptizer, Baptist wasn't his last name, nor was the his middle name. He was John the Baptizer. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now this is our Lord's explanation to his men of what he was talking about. First, he reminds the apostles of something that they were very familiar with, and that is John the Baptist who baptized with water. Now, the reason these men were quite familiar with all this is because they knew John. They were very familiar with John. In fact, some of them had been the disciples of John the Baptist prior to following Christ. Notice just a few verses later in, in Acts 1. We'll get there in a, a few weeks. But I want you to see that when the apostles were looking for someone to replace Judas as an apostle that they had to choose someone who was with them from the very beginning of Christ's ministry, which included, they said, the ministry of John the Baptist. Notice verses 21 and 22 of Acts 1. Therefore, it is necessary, they said, that of the men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning with the baptism of John until the day that he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they're saying, we're going to choose someone who, like us, was right there from the very beginning, even from the point of John baptizing. So they all knew John the Baptist, and they were quite aware that John baptized with water as an outward sign of an individual's inward repentance towards God. This attitude of forsaking sin, once they admitted that and confessed that, John baptized them in water. But now... Jesus says to them, just as John baptized with water, so you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then he adds, not many days from now. Now these words, not many days from now, would prove to be 10 days after his ascension. And the reason we know this is because Luke tells us that Jesus appeared to these men for what? 40 days. He makes that very clear. And we know that these appearances started on what we would call Easter Sunday, the day of the resurrection, which was, at, at that time, it was Passover. Now, in Acts 2, we read that the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost. Pentecost is a Jewish feast which takes place 50 days after Passover. So Jesus was absolutely right. The Spirit would come and empower them not many days from now because he would arrive then 10 days after the 40-day period of meeting with them and then his ascension. Now, when we get to Acts 2, we're going to look closely at exactly what happened when the Holy Spirit came to the apostles. But what I want you to see right now are two very important truths. 
First of all, in using this expression, baptized with the Holy Spirit, Jesus is using words that will be theologically clarified by the Apostle Paul later in his New Testament letters. And what Paul will tell us is that every single Christian at the moment of their salvation is baptized with the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ meaning that they are placed or they are immersed into Christ so that they are joined to him in a very unique union so that he literally indwells them through the Holy Spirit and they become one with him. This is what we read, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 and 13. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, for even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Paul is telling the Corinthians that when they were saved, they became united with Jesus Christ by the baptism with the Holy Spirit, so that along with every other Christian, they became members of his body, meaning his church, the universal church, made up of all of those who have been born again. We're one with Christ. We're one with each other. Now, the apostles, understand this, they were unique in that they didn't experience this baptism with the Spirit until after they were, they, they were saved. They were saved men already because the Spirit, Jesus said, would not come, could not come until he had ascended. Understand this, though. That's not true of any Christian today. Remember, the book of Acts is a very transitional book. There, a book. there are some things that have taken place in Acts in the early days of the church that will not take place now. We're not in a transitional period. This is one of those things. They did not experience the baptism with the Spirit until after they were saved. Not true of us. The very moment that you placed your faith in Christ, you were baptized with the Holy Spirit into Christ so that you were indwelt by him and therefore you became spiritually united to every other true believer. Now this is important. It's important that you understand this because there are many people in Christian circles, especially those in the charismatic movement, who will tell you that you have to pray and you have to plead and you have to seek what they call the baptism of the Spirit. That's not true. The apostles weren't told to seek the baptism. They weren't told to do anything to get the baptism. Just wait. That's all. Just wait for it to happen. In fact, John the Baptist said that it would be Jesus doing the baptizing with the Holy Spirit because the this, because this Spirit baptism, notice this, it is a totally divine act apart from anything that we do. We don't participate in it in the, in the sense that we do anything to get it. We just experience it. We're passive in this sense. John 1.33, John said, I did not recognize him, meaning I didn't recognize Jesus initially, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, he upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. John said, this, this Jesus, the Messiah, the King, he will be baptizing others with the Holy Spirit. I just baptize with water. Now, folks, don't let anyone mislead you. The baptism of the Spirit is not a second work of grace following salvation. It is entirely the work of Jesus Christ at the time of your salvation. As he joins you together with himself and with other believers, and he does this by giving you the Holy Spirit, another helper just like him. That's why the Bible is emphatic that every Christian possesses the Holy Spirit. I hope you know that. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Paul said, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? Paul said this to the carnal Corinthians who, who were not a very good example of what Christians should be. Even with them, the Spirit of God dwelt in them because they were believers. In Romans 8, 7, 
Paul said, if you do not have the spirit of Christ, you don't belong to him. Every believer has the spirit. Now, the second truth that I want you to see about the baptism with the Holy Spirit is that when this took place in the lives of the apostles, an amazing transformation occurred in their lives. As you'll recall, prior to this, Peter had displayed some incredible arrogance and in thinking that he was strong and bold and courageous, claiming that he was willing to die for Jesus. He said, yeah, these other guys may, may flee, but not me, Lord. I'm willing to die with you. And Jesus told him that he would deny him three times on the night he was arrested. That's exactly, as you know, that's exactly what happened. Peter not only denied Jesus, but the scripture said he's, he began to curse and swear. And he said, I don't know the man. And then Luke adds this very poignant statement by telling, this, telling us that as Peter was denying Jesus for the third and final time, we read in Luke twenty-two sixty-one, 61, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had told him, before, before a rooster crows today, you'll deny me three times. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. Peter knew he was wrong. He knew he had failed miserably. And he realized what a coward he was. Just a few hours earlier, he had spoken with such bravado. But now the real truth about him was, was evident. He was so scared of being arrested and crucified himself that he was willing to deny the very one he had called the Son of God, the very one he had loved, the very one he had worshipped, he denied him. And Peter wasn't the only cowardly apostle. All the other apostles had fled and abandoned Jesus when he was arrested. At the final Passover meal, Jesus had predicted that all of them were going to flee and abandon him. He said, you all fall away because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. That's exactly what happened. Mark 14, 50 says they all fled, they, they all left him rather and fled. All of them. Not only Peter, all of them. The next time we see these men together as a group, you know where they are? They are huddled together behind closed doors, fearful of the Jewish authorities who they thought might be coming after them. Listen, that's how these men were before the Holy Spirit indwelt them. Cowardly, fearful, ready to lie and deny Jesus just to save their own skin. But after the Holy Spirit comes and he indwells them, these are completely different men. They're transformed. Notice the boldness that we see with Peter as the spokesman initially of the apostles. Acts chapter 2, starting at verse 14. Now remember... He couldn't, he couldn't even tell a few people in a courtyard that he knew Christ, that he was one of his followers. Now there are thousands of Jewish people in the city of Jerusalem, and we read this. But Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, Men of Judea and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. He goes on to explain what took place, was what was prophesied in the Old Testament. But then notice the boldness of this man, this man who had denied Jesus, starting at verse 22. He said, men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. This man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, Look at this boldness. You nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men. You put him to death. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. Then jump down to verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Wow. Is this the same man? It's the same man who's been transformed because the Spirit of God now is dwelling in him. Folks, this is incredible boldness. And throughout the book of Acts, we see the same kind of, of boldness, not, not only from Peter, but from all the apostles. Why such a difference? Because when the Holy Spirit indwells you, he empowers you to be bold for Christ. But here's where I want to clarify something. Something very important. Because some of you may be thinking, you know what, I know I'm a Christian, and therefore I know that the Holy Spirit dwells in me, but I'm not bold like this. 
I still struggle with being bold for Jesus Christ. Well, then listen very closely. Just because the Spirit of God indwells you doesn't make you automatically a bold witness, a fearless witness. The Bible teaches that just having the Spirit doesn't make us bold. What makes us bold and useful for the Lord is, note this, it's when the Holy Spirit has you. When he's in control of your life, which the scripture refers to as being filled or dominated or controlled by the Spirit. I want you to notice something important. Acts chapter 2. I want you to notice verses 1 through 4. As I said, when we get to this, we'll, we'll go into more detail, but this is important. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting, and there appeared to them tongues as a fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. Now I want you to notice verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now in these verses, I want you to know, and this is very important, that two distinct truths, two of them, two distinct truths concerning the Holy Spirit are present. First of all, the apostles were baptized with the Holy Spirit as he came to indwell them. That's the promise. That's what happened. But in verse 4, we're told that they were also, at that moment, filled with the Spirit. Now, the baptism and the filling, in their case, happened at exactly the same time. But they are really two distinct things, and you have to keep that in mind. So what is the filling of the Spirit? Well, Ephesians 5.18 says, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, that is excess, that is riotous, that is a terrible thing, but be filled with the Spirit. For those of you who were here last Sunday night, you'll know that we covered this in detail in our study of Ephesians. But the gist, the gist of this truth is that whereas those who are drunk with wine are controlled by the wine, by the alcohol, Those who are filled with the Spirit are under the Spirit's control. And how does the Spirit control you? It's not mystical. It's not mysterious. He controls you as you yield to his voice. Say, what voice? It's called the Bible. The Bible. As you yield to the Word of God, you are yielding and being filled with the Spirit. That's how he controls you. You want boldness in your witnessing, understand this, you already have the Holy Spirit residing in you. He's given you his power. But the way you release his power is when you yield control of your life to the Holy Spirit. Moment by moment, as you submit to his voice, which is the Bible, the word of God. So I ask you this. Do you let the Holy Spirit control you? Are you even aware of him? If he were, he's not going to do this, but if he were to leave you, would you even notice that? Is obedience to God's word what matters most in your life? Are there areas of your life where you knowingly, knowingly, consciously know that you are withholding them from the Spirit's control because you know you're being disobedient to his word, the Bible? If you want to experience his power, and courage in witnessing, you need to make sure that you are under the control of the Spirit of God by being under control of the authority of the Word of God. So if you need to repent of anything, do so now. If you need to get things right with the Lord, right with other people, make it a point to do it and release the power of the Spirit in your life. And if you consistently refuse to do this, if, if obedience to the Word of God means nothing to you, then I have to tell you, you don't know Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about you being up and down your Christian life. If you don't care at all, it means you don't don't know Christ because true Christians follow Christ. True Christians desire to obey his word. Even when they blow it, they they do what Peter did. They, They weep, if not outwardly, in their hearts and they repent and they get things right. So if you are not a Christian, come to Christ today. It's not too late. Repent of your sin of being in charge of your life. Trust Christ as your Savior with a heart of surrender to him as your king. If you need to speak to to anyone after, we'll have some of our 
elders will be up here at the front. Feel free to come up and they'll talk to you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you it is powerful, Lord. We thank you that you have told us here and then throughout the New Testament what it means to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. We thank you he indwells us. We pray that you'll help us, Lord, to have even more of a, of a consciousness, not a feeling, but a consciousness, an awareness that we take by faith that he's with us, that Christ is here through the Spirit. Lord, we pray that you help us to be bold and yet gracious and loving in our witness, not overbearing, not dominating people, but lovingly to share the gospel with a, a lost world. We pray if there be any here who don't know Christ, that you will show them that they don't know you, that you will convict them that their disobedience is evidence, continual disobedience without repentance, evidence that they're still lost in their sins. I pray you'll draw them to yourself. I pray for each one of us who knows you. May, may you make it clear to us any areas of our lives that are not under your dominance that we might indeed repent of that. All of this, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. We'll see you tonight. Mm -hmm.